Yeah. 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 I want to make sure I get it right. Sure I get it. Uh, Garrett came to us with a kind of a wildlife degree, and uh, he, he um, wanted to study amphibians and reptiles, but he wanted to work some kind of management aspect into all of this project. And we had been hot around quite a bit, and then we found something, this project, uh, and this I think fits Garrett very, very nicely. And as these projects go, he's way ahead of the game uh, uh, from some of the stuff that I've seen published. He, he's already gotten sample sizes that these other guys have had. So um, I'm not going to beat it to death. I'm going to let Garrett talk. Thank you, Dr. Fine. <coughs> like I said, my name is Garrett. Um, and I'm a graduate student on the Dr. Klein for a biology department. So my thesis, like you said, kind of bumped around a little bit. I had an experience, which I'll get into, that kind of prompted me to want to do this a little bit more. But um, So the title of my uh, thesis is The Effects of Prescribed Burning on Herpetofauna Communities in the Shoal Creek District of the Talladega National Forest, which if you don't know where that is, that is actually in our backyard about 20 minutes away on Chakalaka WMA and um, Doug Mountain. So basically from <clears throat> what you're looking at here is a map from Doug Mountain all the way down to the bottom of Talladega National Forest, to the Shoal Creek District where the office is down off of uh, Highway 9. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what we're doing here is uh, we're examining how fire <clears throat> affects a landscape. When I was out, um, I had a job in New Mexico, and we were, I was a wildlife specialist at a scout ranch there, and we had a uh, major forest fire. And we were getting to the point where we were preparing to do prescribed burning and getting our land prepped for that, but it was too late because we had a lightning strike and torched basically a tender box that didn't get rained for a year. And we had to basically restart. So I was out looking at the landscape, and I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And then I brought it to Dr. Klein's attention, and he's like, yeah, we can totally see and make a project out of this. Because what I'm trying to push is that management, tech, fire on the landscape is a, is a need for the forest. <clears throat> no matter what forest, you can, or um, no matter what kind of forest it is, you have to have fire on the landscape in some form or fashion. And what U.S. Forest Service does, where I got most of this data, and who's a Bit helping me get through this project as well in the field. <clears throat> what they do is they are talking about bringing in different techniques of using fire. So <clears throat> if you use fire on the landscape, it's been proven that the damage is less per or pertinent than if you have, say, a major disturbance such as a wildfire. <clears throat> so what I'm looking at is um, how they use their different burn techniques to manage for different wildlife species, but I want to know how, say, the reptiles and amphibians deal with it, or how some of the non-game species <clears throat> deal with it, because basically in management, in wildlife management, you see management for threatened and endangered species, and game species that you pay money to hunt because of, through license sales and all that, which is great. <clears throat> because we need to be able to drive those management techniques and we need to be able to drive that research through license sales. But species that aren't either threatened and endangered or of economic value kind of down here on the list of research. So that's why I'm trying to understand <clears throat> how some of these animals react to this. So <clears throat> I'll start you off with the map right here. <clears throat> like I said, this is the um, Talladega National Forest Hill Creek District. It's kind of hard to see. I should have brought it on a PowerPoint, but I didn't know we were doing it in this format, so you have to bear with me. If you like to see, you can come up and take a look. <clears throat> but, so we have a map here. We have different colors. Uh, this data was through the U.S. Forest Service, and I did some of my own GIS work and <clears throat> manipulated it to where I want to see what I wanted to see. <clears throat> so you have the red area, the yellow area, and the green area, <clears throat> and the gray area. The colors are representing the different areas or different burn blocks 
in the Taliban National Forest. <clears throat> and the burn block is determined by how often an area is burnt. So for example, um, quail. <clears throat> they require a lot of shrubby land, not a lot of uh, canopy coverage. And you, to get that, you have to, <clears throat> they decide to burn an area one, every one to three years. So we took the one to three year burn uh, prescription area and we put four uh, transects in it. <clears throat> we did that for <clears throat> the yellow area, which is three to five years of, uh, re of uh, frequency for burning. And we did that for a five to eight year burn uh, frequency treatment area. <clears throat> and we also had a control area which has been burned in the past, but not within like the last 10 or 15 years. Therefore, it's as close to untouched as we're going to get to make it a control. <clears throat> we have that set up here in the Duggar Mountain uh, wilderness area. So how we're doing this is we're doing uh, basically, we're just going out, we're walking around, and we're lifting logs and looking under rocks and counting what we see. We have a data sheet. We record the time of which something is captured. We record um, what species was captured, and we record the temperature, what, what time of day it is, the date, all that. Basic, you know, um, data analysis sheets. So <clears throat> we're using other methods as well. So we have uh, tarps. We're using these uh, black, uh, I'm trying to think of how to say it, cover sheets that we've cut out to be a square meter, and we're using that as artificial cover to see if we can kind of bring in some more animals that may not be able to find that cover <clears throat> in some of the areas, just to kind of get an idea of what species is there. Because it's not, I'm not saying it's going to drag something all the way from one side of the forest to the other, because someone's advertising that there's black. Uh, black tarps out there for rent, but it's gonna, it's gonna give that area, or it's gonna give those species already there a place to kind of hide out so we can get out there quick enough to identify what's there and add it to our couch. And we do that, we have four transects per site, and, uh, or four transects per regi regime, and there's two sites per um, treatment area. So, and each transect is 200 meters long. So I have 10 tarps, and we also have a, um, a uh, PVC pipe system for collecting tree frog data because the tree frogs are going there and use that as shelter as well. And all these methods have been used in the past, whether it be from a school that I saw. I got the tarp method from a, a paper that I read from a school in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire, not really known for its reptile amphibian diversity, you know, thinking that maybe we're going to triple what they got by using the same or measurement or by using the same methods because of our uh, reptile amphibian diversity down here, which is working fairly well. And so we're see and we're lifting these sheets and we're seeing and we're counting what we're seeing. Here's a picture of uh, me and one of my helpers, uh, Taylor Prickett. Um, he's a recent graduate of JSU, <coughs> setting one of our tarps down. Here's just a picture of what we're uh, looking at. This is a red-back salamander, uh, Plethodon serratus. Uh, we found that one under a cover sheet. I think we found that one, like six others under like the first day we were out there checking, which was like the Super Bowl. Seeing that my project or my method actually worked it was like, but um, <clears throat> anyways. So again, our hypothesis is gonna be that uh, herbophonal communities are affected by the presence and absence of canopy coverage manipulated by different prescribed fire treatments. We also think that species diversity will be more amphibious in areas that with denser canopy coverage because moisture can be held in more <clears throat> when you have a denser canopy, when you have a little bit more <clears throat> moisture on the ground because the sun isn't always able to hit it through, the, through that canopy. And species, species diversity will be more reptilian in areas with more with more less canopy coverage. So you're talking like the one to three area which doesn't have a lot of canopy coverage. That's where you're going to see more of your basking reptiles out and about compared to your amphibians that need that moisture that is held in by 
um, the canopy. So, and the goal of this experiment is to study prescribed fire techniques implemented for wildlife management practices and the impacts that these techniques have on herpetofauna communities and populations. <clears throat> so, I'll move over here. I kind of already talked about my methods right here. <clears throat> um, but, so we just, we, like I said, I'm just starting this experiment, and like Dr. Klein said, I've already gotten pretty far ahead than other studies in the past. <clears throat> I'm not trying to brag, I'm just saying. <laughs> Anyways, so we have just a preliminary data. So we did a, a graph saying amphibians versus reptiles collected from burn regimes. So we have the burn regimes listed control, one to three, three to five, and five to eight. And the blue bar represents how many amphibians were captured versus how many reptiles were captured. Now, given the time of year and whatever the weather is doing, I don't know, but we're not really going to see a lot of reptiles running around, running around right now because of the temperatures, whatever they want to be on a Sunday when I go out and collect. And so we've been seeing a lot more uh, amphibians, but what we've mostly been seeing a lot of, which is more surprising, is that we've been seeing more of the redback salamanders more than anything. That's been the most dominant species thus far. We have found a few reptiles and a few different types of salamanders, but primarily we've been finding that, which raises some eyebrows because <clears throat> there are multiple subspecies that are hard to decipher from just um, identifying but off the cuff. You have to take some DNA analysis and some uh, other analysis to actually take a look at that, and there might be some potential for that, but I have to get a little bit more money for that part, so. Um, and then we have the method of specimen capture. Uh, the orange represents cover, the, I mean, the cover sheets, and the VES, which is visual encounter surveys. Again, that's just us walking around and lifting up logs and rocks and taking a look at that. <clears throat> that's the um, ratio of how many uh, species are seen between different methods. So, I wrote it out here, the yes, 44 individuals or 44 organisms were found, and that's 68% of the total amount of organisms we've found thus far. And under the cover sheets, we found 21 organisms and 30% of overall. And you see the pipes, which is our PVC pipe. I haven't found anything in them yet, because, again, it's that time of year. Uh, <clears throat> frogs have just started calling again, so we expect to start seeing them in the pipes here pretty soon, as long as we don't have a 1993 blizzard or something. Like, because they said the biggest snowstorm was what, in March 1993? So, <coughs> anyways. Um, so that's, that's about all I have. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Klein, and I'd like to thank Dr. Waffer, and I'd like to thank Dr. Triplett for all serving on my survey, or sorry, committee. <coughs> I'd like to thank everyone else, Dr. TJ, Dr. Burns, and all the rest of the biology department who's been uh, so supportive of me thus far, and my, my lab, Klein Lab, and uh, everyone who's helped me on my field work so far, and Philmont Scout Ranch for providing me uh, some funding to study what we could do to make that place better after we regrow from the fire. So, and Jacksonville State for allowing me and taking a chance on me to do this research one other people wouldn't. So, that'll be it. Any questions? <coughs>